It is our privilege to welcome Tim Percival, who is the Disaster Response Manager at American Humane and currently serves as the chair of NARSC, the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition. He is joining us to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of different types of temporary emergency sheltering. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking to everybody about uh, disaster animal shelters. Um, but first thing that I wanna talk about is the different types of animals that um, we're going to be we're discussing. So mainly we're gonna be talking about household pets and then some farm animals. So dogs, cats, pocket pets, or whatever other household pets are um, in your area, different jurisdictions have different types of pets that they sometimes allow in the shelters. When we talk about farm animals, we're usually talking about lower numbers. So not, you know, leaving out commercial farms and that sort of thing, but some uh, small hobby farms that may include some um, dogs, or I'm sorry, some cattle, llamas, ducks, um, and, and then even some equine. Uh, so again, we're going to be excluding and not talking about wildlife, exotic animals, commercial farms, or other different types of um, animal facilities. So disaster animal shelters have been around for a long time. There's, it, you know, ever since Noah's Ark, uh, probably the first time I've heard about a disaster animal shelter, um, they've, been, they've been happening ever since. The thing is, is it's important that we keep up with technology, different best practices, and sometimes the needs of, of um, animals and their environments change. So it's important that we look at different concepts and different um, things that we may need to do in the future or for current uh, shelters and not just go with what we've done in the past. Using those past um, experiences is a good background, but it's, it is important to change. So we're going to be talking about mainly three different kinds of shelters and some of the advantages and disadvantages of these. So we're going to be talking about animal-only shelters, co-located shelters, cohabitated shelters, and then we'll discuss a little bit about hybrids of these. So the very first thing that I want to talk about is animal-only shelters. An animal-only shelter are um, shelters that really only have animals. There aren't people inside these shelters. Sometimes people, um, pet owners and people aren't even allowed inside the shelters. Uh, so it's, it's um, strictly an animal shelter. This is more the traditional type of shelter. They're still used on a regular basis. But there are some uh, different types of shelters that are coming into play more and more. But the, the animal only shelter is probably still the most common type of animal shelter during disasters. So one of the things the uh, things about um, and an animal only shelter is the different types of animals that you can have. You can have owned animals and these animals might be from people um, that have been displaced by the disaster. Um, you might have stray animals. So these are animals that people are bringing in um, that they found on their property or running around um, and that they need to be cared for. And then you may have rescued animals. And these are your official rescue groups that are going out and rescuing animals. And it might even be your own team. And th these animal-only shelters a lot of times can handle all these different types of animals. The other thing about an animal-only shelter is it can have um, all different kinds of species of animals. So this might include dogs, cats, you know, your typical um, household pets, but it could also include large animals. An animal only shelter might have cattle or equine or llamas or even, you know, geese and ducks and whatever else. So an animal only shelter is still, like I said, probably one of the most common types of shelters out there. One of the things with animal only shelters is it since it is an animal only shelter, it is important that you have staff and volunteers. These staff and volunteers are going to be doing everything inside the shelter. They're gonna be doing the management of the shelter. They're gonna be providing daily care. If you have veterinarians, they're going to be providing the veterinary care, vaccinations, that sort of thing with the animals. Um, sometimes uh, there's transport and placement in place and the animal only shelter uh, staff and volunteers will be taking care of that also. It, it goes on and on. They'll be doing logistics, um, everything that, that takes place inside this animal only shelter. Um, some of the things that the pros and cons to this um, is, first of all, probably the biggest pro is 
that you have full control of the shelter because it's your staff and volunteers that are working in here. So you set the schedule, you provide daily care, you provide the food, you do everything for that shelter. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, pluses to that. The other plus is, is it's owned, unowned, you know, like I said before, it might be rescued um, and stray animals all can be in this shelter. And then the different species. So those are some of the major pluses with this. Um, some of the downsides to it is it's expensive. Again, you provide everything. So when it comes to food, you're providing that food. Now it might be donated food, but you're still providing the food, the supplies. You may have to um, feed your staff and volunteers. It, everything. So it can be expensive. And one of the biggest downsides to this is animals are away from their owners. And so this can be a challenge. Now, these animal only shelters, um, another thing that can be an advantage that I don't have in here is sometimes they're in your typical brick and mortar shelter. If you're able to um, evacuate all the animals pre-storm or pre-disaster, um, you might be able to use that brick and mortar shelter as this animal only shelter. Now saying that that's not the only time. I've been in animal only shelters that have been in warehouses, schools, even a tent. So um, there's the, these can be all over the place. The next type of shelter that I want to talk about is co-located shelters. Co-located shelters are where ant or owners care for their own animals. So the staff and volunteers aren't caring for the animals as much. It's really up to the owners to provide that da daily care for the animals. This is usually in a nearby building, or it could be in the same building in a separate area, uh, depending on the building. Um, one of the challenges with this is if it is in a nearby building, um, it needs to be nearby. If it's 10 miles down the road, or if you want to use kilometers, I'll just say 10 kilometers down the road, um, then it's important that you have transportation available for those animal owners to provide care for the animals that are in that nearby shelter. Um, there are some other challenges with this that, that I won't really get into, but it might be if they are in the same um, area, it might have to be um, separate ventilation system and that sort of thing. But again, um, the, the owners are caring for the animals in this particular type of shelter. So one of the challenges with this is because the owners are providing care, these are all owned animals. So you're not going to have strays or rescued animals unless those rescue animals are coming from uh, people, the, owned, the, pe the owners of, um, of those animals. So the daily care of this is usually from the pet owners themselves. You'll need to have some staff and volunteers nearby, but most of the care is going to be from those owners. So that is a huge plus. It's, um, it's really nice to have the owners being able to care for the, the pets. Um, it's a plus for the pets and the owners. It provides a lot less stress for the owners because they know the care that's being provided and they're able to be with the, the uh, pets. And then of course the pets are being cared for people that they know and love versus somebody that they may have never seen before. Another big uh, pro or plus to this is it usually requires a lot less people than um, a typical um, animal only shelter. So um, because you have the owners coming in, uh, they're providing that care. So you may not need as much daily care there. You might just need a little bit more management, uh, that sort of thing to help care for these animals. Some of the challenges with this is that the owners may not be able to care for the animals when needed. Maybe they have to go to work or they have an appointment. And so you need to make sure that you have somebody that can care for those animals um, when need be. It's also really important that you have the animal owners sign a, an agreement or a contract um, for if they don't show up to care for the animals in multiple days, you have a plan on what to, to do with those animals. They, the animals still need to make sure, you need to make sure that they still have food, they're getting their exercise, that sort of thing. So you need to make sure that there's um, a sign in, sign out sheet. And so you, you're able to uh, keep track of the care of those animals. And that can be a con um, if people aren't able to come um, help the animals. A lot of people think that because this is, um, the people are providing care for the animals, um, that they'll bring everything. Chances are, if they are using a co-located shelter, 
chances are you'll still need to provide the food, the supplies, and everything else needed for these animals. The pet owners might have some, but it's going to be pretty limited. So it is important that you, um, as the um, animal, the people in charge of the shelter, you have a, a plan for that. The next one that I want to talk about is a cohabitated shelter. Cohabitated shelters are, are rising in popularity, and this is where people and animals are housed together. So like this picture, um, people are sleeping right next to their animals. Now, this picture probably isn't the best example because it's usually that the people are on a cot and the, the dog would be inside of a crate. I just wanted to, to show that the relationship and how they're, they're housed together. This is something that's becoming much more common and much more popular um, when it comes to sheltering. And there's a lot of pluses and minuses to this. Um, first of all, talking about animals, just like a co-located shelter, all the animals here are going to be owned. So um, you're not going to have strays or rescued animals coming in, again, unless those rescued animals belong to the owners that are here. Um, Another thing is that um, the owners um, may have a limited, um, um, I mean, I'm sorry, you might have limited staff and volunteers that are there. So that's another plus. Actually, there are times because this is also a human shelter that you may not have any animal people there at all. And it might just be that um, one of the staff and volunteers on the human side is acting as a liaison to the animal people. So if there is a, a need, they, the animal people can come in. So this might have the least number of staff and volunteers animal related out of all three. The pros are, are the owners are providing all the care for the animals. And um, this is really a benefit because like I mentioned earlier, the stress for the animals um, and the people is, it's a lot less. It's probably the quietest type of shelter too. A lot of times you go into these types of shelters and you don't hear barking or whining uh, because the, the animals are there with their people. The people are able to feel like they are able to provide care and they feel needed during a disaster, which is pretty important for a lot of people. One of the challenges is these types of shelters are usually the first to fill up and the last to close. People want to be with their pets. So if they have the option to, to be in a cohabitated shelter, usually they're going to go there first. So they're going to fill up before the other types of shelters will. Um, and then a lot of times it's hard for people, if they've been displaced due to the disaster, it's hard for them to, uh, to um, find housing. So a lot of times they are the last to close. So that can be a challenge and you need to have a plan for that. Traditionally, these types of shelters have been um, with by like, community centers or uh, churches or other areas that aren't your typical type of shelter, um, but they're, they're starting to become a lot more um, popular. Another challenge with this and a co-located shelter is the, the people are not trained on caring for animals. So it might be that they they have a dog that's an inside dog and they just open the back door and they let the dog run out in the backyard. So they may, this dog might not be leash trained. The people may not know how to use a slip lead or other types of um, equipment that you might have. Um, they may not used to be used to picking up uh, the feces from animals and it goes on and on. So there are some challenges with that, um, with cohabitated sheltering, but they usually pick it up pretty quick and um, it, that side of it is uh, a less of a challenge. So trying to compare these side by side, some of the advantages and disadvantages between the, the three. The advantages of an animal only shelter are you can have all types of animals. They might be owned or strayed or rescued. You can have large and small. I mean, it's hard to have um, horses in a cohabitated shelter. So that might be in a co-located shelter, but those are some of the challenges that you might have with the cohabitated shelter versus the other two. Some of the advantages of an animal only that you may have. Um, an animal only shelter, you have full control where the co-located and the cohabitated, you may have to set times and you, you're relying on the owners to provide care for that. So that can be a plus to an animal only. A lot of times with an animal only shelter, you're providing all the veterinary care and vaccinations. 
So that can be a plus. You know that all the animals have been vaccinated and you're able to provide the veterinary care for that. A lot of times with that, that means that you are also paying for that veterinary care. So with the co-located and especially cohabitated shelter, sometimes that veterinary care is being provided, paid for by the animal owners. So it can be a challenge. It depends on how you're able to um, do the veterinary care and the vaccination. So that can vary from shelter to shelter. One of the biggest pluses with an animal only shelter is uh, you have full control and you have trained caregivers that are providing um, care for those animals. Um, it's expensive, animal only shelters are expensive um, and you need a lot of staff and volunteers to provide that care. So co-located sheltering, some of the advantages are people get to be with their animals. They're not with them 24 seven like they are with a cohabitated shelter, but they are able to visit. Um, and you do need a lot less uh, staff and volunteers with this. You only can really have owned animals and you do have um, untrained caregivers that are going to be there. You still need to provide the food, supplies and everything else. And like I mentioned earlier, sometimes the payment for veterinary care might be difficult unless you have a plan for um, your organization to pay for that veterinary care. And it still needs to be near a human shelter. Cohabitated shelters, the plus is there are people with their pets all the time. They're providing all the care. Some of the challenges is it might be difficult for them to leave the shelter because their pets might be there. What ends up happening a lot of times is you have people that um, get to know other people within the shelter. So they end up taking care of each other's pets quite often. So that can be a huge, a huge plus. Some of the downsides to having a co-located and especially a cohabitated shelter is you still need to have the animal only shelter. It's also important if you have that cohabitated shelter that you still have a human only shelter um, for people that don't have pets, have a place for those people that don't have pets to go because um, that, that can provide some challenges. So with these three different types of shelters, there can be some variations. And sometimes we have a hybrid shelter. And this might be a combination of, of any of the three different types of shelters I just mentioned. But the most common is going to be an animal-only shelter and a co-located shelter. And it might be that you the people the co-located, the, the pet owners aren't allowed to go into the area with the animal only, or sometimes they're intertwined. Um, so some of the challenges with this is sometimes you might have duplication of species in different areas. Um, sometimes you, um, it can get complicated on who's caring for their pets and who's not. So it's important that you have good documentation um, of what animals are what. Um, the other challenge that you might have is uh, separating um, for quarantine or isolation. Uh, so, so the pets that strays and rescued pets that may come in that might be sick aren't um, making other animals sick that belong to the pet owners. So there's a lot of different challenges with these, but there's some pluses. Is The big one is it might be one shelter. So rather than having an animal only shelter and a co-located shelter you only need to have supplies and staff for one and so that can be a huge plus to having some sort of hybrid shelter so that's the basic types of shelters that i'm going to be going over but one of the things that oh uh, that i want to talk about is sheltering alternatives and these are gaining in popularity also one of the things that we're really looking at um, across the united states especially is emergency fostering. So can we find people that can possibly foster um, animals in need uh, instead of sheltering? There's, there's um, some programs for peer-to-peer -peer fostering that are happening. So that way the people that need their animals foster can reach out to um, somebody that's able to foster and everything that happens happens between them and it leaves emergency management, animal rescue groups, everybody else out of that. Um, so that way it's an agreement between the two different uh, people. Um, there might be a need for transporting um, to other facilities. Maybe your shelter's too small or you don't have the ability to um, be in a, um, a temporary facility. For example, uh, we were in Louisiana one time and there was a hurricane and we were in tents um, afterwards. 
problem was is the second um, hurricane was coming through. And so we were still intense during that time. So those are some others. And then the big one that's really a good, good one to look at is feeding in place. And this can be the least stressful for animals because they're in an on environment. Of course, if people had to evacuate, we want them to try to evacuate with their pets, but there are times that feeding in place takes place. The last thing I wanna discuss real quick is um, as of this year, the American Red Cross is accepting pets into some, some shelters. And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. Um, it's not all shelters, but the care of the animals is going to be by the owners and by the partners. Um, the supplies and guidance and et cetera is going to be by your lo the local partners. So I would suggest if, you, if it's your jurisdiction to care for pets in your area, that you may want to reach out to the American Red Cross, emergency management, other, other organizations to see what your role is going to be with sheltering pets. Um, if there's a, a need for a disaster. Um, one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to have these people called pet champions. These pet champions are there to work with organizations pre-disaster. And then, um, then you have pet liaisons that work with partners during the disaster. Chances are a lot of times these are the same people, but these are two different positions that the American Red Cross has. And this is a brand new thing that they're trying out. And you should be hearing more about this um, in the future with Red Cross, but um, I just wanted to mention it here. There's a lot of things that I didn't discuss when it comes to pros and cons with disaster animal sheltering. Here's a few of them. Um, due to the time, I just wanted to keep it pretty high level, but um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And um, we have a few minutes left for questions. So here's my contact information and I'll open it up. And sorry for going just a little bit long. Now, Tim, you're actually perfectly on time. We appreciate it. Um, we did have one question already, but please do go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box so we can ask Tim. Um, how long do people typically stay in co-located and cohabitated shelters? Are we seeing shorter or longer stays as compared to the human only, animal only shelter diet? That's a, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times, one of the things we didn't go over is hold time and how long your organization is going to hold the animals. And that's a whole separate discussion on its own. So a lot of times um, when you decide to close a shelter is based on the hold time, how long you've, if you're going to hold the animals for two weeks, if it's, you're gonna hold them for a month or even if you're gonna hold them for just three days. That's really going to determine how long your shelter is going to, to be open. Now, when it comes to the co-located and cohabitated shelters, um, that's going to be an important part to look um, on that, that long-term housing for people. So it might turn the, the go from temporary housing into more long-term housing for people. And so sometimes it can last, last a lot longer than normal. It also depends on your home, homeless population or um, I forget, I'm drawing a blank on the current term, but basically people that don't have homes, sometimes they want to stay in one of these shelters um, for longer than the normal. So um, that's going to be a determination that you have within your own jurisdiction on how long you're going to keep those shelters open. If you're going to be asking for rescue groups to come in, sometimes that's going to determine how long you're going to be able to keep it open because you only have help for this amount of time. So it's a difficult question and I don't quite have the answer. There's a lot of variables to figure out how long those shelters are going to be open. Wonderful. In Australia, there is a big or ongoing push to encourage people to be as self-sufficient and self-reliant as possible. So perhaps evacuating two friends or using the independent fostering system you mentioned. Um, it, possibly this encourages authorities not to make them too comfortable. Is there a similar push in the United States or elsewhere that you're aware of? Yeah, that's that's something we've discussed, you've talked about for years. Ideally, you want, um, if you can get your jurisdiction to really push pet preparedness, um, that's going to be huge. If you can have people find their own shelter, that's going to be good. One of the things that we find a lot of times is people will go into hotels, especially if they, if 
if they have some money or if they have insurance, they're allowed to go into hotels. But sometimes these hotels don't, don't allow pets. So the people are staying in the hotels, but the pets are staying in shelters. What we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage people to try to find those pet friendly hotels beforehand, try to find friends and family to stay with beforehand. And that's going to be really important um, because if you can, if you can find those friends and family, then you can find out if your pet gets along with their pets or your pet gets along with their, their kids. Um, because eventually they may decide to give you the boot because you're not, you, pe people or animals just don't get along. So looking at that preparedness is huge. If you can keep people out of shelters and animals out of shelters, that's the way to go. Um, and everybody's going to be happier and everybody's going to be more comfortable. And it is less um, stress on emergency management and animal welfare organizations also. So pet preparedness is probably the most important thing that we need to do to keep people out of shelters and better themselves. Thank you. Have you seen many issue, issues for displaced people moving into temporary accommodation or rentals with their animals? Um, and are these people offer surrendering their animals after wildfires and floods? So if they have been staying with family and friends and the dynamics are not conducive, they're asked to leave. And so now they're moving into disaster accommodations. Um, are you seeing surrendering at that point? Can you talk about that for just about a minute? Yeah, so that's a huge one. We do see an increase with that. What, what I found is lower income uh, people, if they uh, they're the people that we see a lot in shelters, human shelters and their pets. So if they've lost their home and their lower income, they may not have insurance that allows them to stay in long-term rental, or they may not be able to go back to their home and get repairs immediately because their home has been damaged. So we're seeing that a lot where people are, um, they're, they're forfeiting their pets because they're not able to keep them. They're, they're in a flux uh, in their own situation, so they're not able to keep, keep the animals. Um, so we are seeing that quite a bit. And that's another part with disaster preparedness that we really want to try to, to focus on is trying to get people to, to look ahead of time on how to care for their pets. And But we are seeing a, a, an increase, I would say, with um, people relinquishing their animals due to um, lack of housing. Which makes a, a hard situation even more tragic. It's, it is hard. It, it's even more difficult because in the United States, at least, most of the shelters are full. So it's hard when they do uh, relinquish their animals, trying to find new, um, new homes for those animals. Absolutely. Did any of our attendees have any questions for Tim before we let him go back to the deployment that he's on, <laughs> that he's joining us from? Okay, Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your thoughts from years of experience. We very much appreciate it.